invite you again to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. And the last couple of evenings that we've been in Daniel chapter 9, we have been witness to Daniel's prayer. Uh, this one who has been the servant of God in exile in Babylon since he was a teen is now 81 years old or so, and still longing to see God's glorious purposes fulfilled for Israel, his people. And as we have seen the last couple of weeks, Daniel has prayed, and he has prayed incredibly dependently upon the scriptures themselves. Deuteronomy has been all through Daniel's prayers. The prophets contemporary to Daniel, their words have been on Daniel's lips as he prays. And Daniel has been praying God's own words back to God in a heartfelt desire that the people of Israel would turn to God. I believe Daniel's prayer is, in fact, a plea for God to fulfill his promises of new covenant regeneration for Israel. The very promises that God laid out in the demand of Deuteronomy 10, circumcise your hearts, and in the promise of Deuteronomy 30, I will circumcise your hearts. And that, of course, sandwiches the promises that God would made that if Israel would obey him, they would be blessed in the land. They would prosper and be free from their enemies. And if they disobeyed God, if they failed in covenant loyalty to Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God who graciously redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt and made promises to them and give, then gave them gracious directives for how to live, if they failed in that, God promised that he would be faithful to himself and he would curse them. And he would exile them from the land. He threatened that if they indeed wanted to go after foreign gods, he would give them exactly what they asked for. They would indeed go to foreign nations and they would serve foreign gods there. And Daniel, in that land of captivity, looking back on God's gracious provision and his promises and his threats, has seen God be faithful to all of these things and has seen the nation of Israel faithless. And what is embedded in Deuteronomy, aside from the commands to remember and do not forget over and over and over again, is the promise that Israel would indeed fail to keep their end of the covenant and that God would bring them back. He would bring them back to the land and he would cause them by supernatural regeneration, a circumcision of the heart, to keep up their end of the bargain. And we see in all of this God's grace. These are promises just like the gospel. A demand from God that says you must be born again. A demand, frankly, that sinful human beings cannot keep. How do I make something like that happen to myself? I, I can't bring about new birth. And you parents know that you long for new birth in your children and you can't wave a wand and zap something and just say the right words and make it happen. We are utterly and wholly dependent on a supernatural work of God to change the heart. And what comes with all of that is repentance and faith. And for the people of Israel, that kind of repentance and faith, a belief in God and a turning to him from the heart would result in covenant blessings. That is, a land and prosperity and a Davidic king. And Daniel in Babylonian exile with the people of Judah has not yet seen these promises come to pass. Only the promises for exile and cursing, and not yet the promises for restoration, return to the land, and spiritual rejuvenation from the inside out. These are still all outstanding promises. And as we looked at over the last couple of weeks in Daniel's prayer, we feel this angst in Daniel, this question in his heart. So what if we get back to the land? And we are not renewed from the inside out. What if we go back to the land of Israel still as idolaters as a nation? I believe that is Daniel's burden in this prayer. And God answers Daniel's prayer. That's where we are beginning tonight. Let's look at God's answer to Daniel's prayer. Beginning in Daniel 9 verse 20. Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel... And presenting my supplication before Yahweh my God on behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness 
about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction, and he talked with me, and he said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy sevens have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then, after the sixty-two sevens, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one seven. But in the middle of the seven, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. This is God's answer to the angel Gabriel to Daniel's prayer. And because this is inscripturated, this is written for us, this is God's word to us as well. Let's look at this this evening together. We're going to see how, how God answered Daniel's prayer. And he answers Daniel's prayer with an interruption, some instruction, and illumination. Let's begin with the interruption. This is Daniel 9, 20 and 21. Daniel says, now while I was speaking... There in verse 20. And then the same phrase in the first part of verse 21. While I was still speaking in prayer. The answer to Daniel's prayer comes before he is finished praying. Daniel's in the middle of praying, he says, and confessing his sin and the sin of his people Israel and presenting his supplication before Yahweh on behalf of the holy mountain of God. And while Daniel is praying, this interruption comes. We saw those elements in Daniel's prayer, the speaking to God in adoration and then confession of sin and then presenting his request, a supplication. And what was it Daniel was confessing? Look down at verse 20. I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. Daniel was confessing his own sin. And, and this is just good to remember. Daniel might have been the holiest guy around at that time. And Daniel is concerned with his own sin before Yahweh. He is confessing his own sin. And we know this is true theologically. There is no one who does not sin. There's no one who's perfect before the Lord or pleasing to God on his own merit. And so we could look to the, the best of those in world history and recognize they needed to confess their own sins. Daniel here is confessing his own sin. And he also says he, con he is confessing the sin of, notice this, my people Israel. Notice he does not say, and I was confessing the sins of the captives of Judah who were with me in Babylon. It's very interesting that Daniel includes the entire nation of Israel in this confession. He recognizes that while Judah is in Babylonian captivity for their rejection of God. It is Israel as an entire nation with whom God made covenant promise. And it is Israel as a nation that has rebelled against God. And Israel, the northern ten tribes, went into Assyrian captivity already for their idolatry. And Judah followed for her sins. The whole covenantal plan of God for Israel is in view here in Daniel's confession. In fact, Daniel prays for a nation that in total has been divided since its fourth administration. It was 931 B.C. after Solomon that the nation of Israel was divided into northern and southern tribes. It is now 539 B.C. Daniel, again, is about 81 years old. That's 392 years since there was a united Israel. And Daniel is praying for Israel as a whole. 
just by way of comparison, what was happening in the United States of America 392 years ago. That was the year 1630. Uh, that was when the town of Boston was founded with a couple of buildings, popcorn was discovered, and William Bradford was re-elected governor of Plymouth Colony. Do you think back that far when you think of the United States of America? This is Daniel's perspective on God's covenant promises with the nation. He is looking back and therefore looking forward to a united Israel to receive the covenant blessings that God had promised. Daniel was praying toward a united monarchy under a Davidic king, thinking through all that it means for God to have made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who became Israel, and the sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, and the united nation under a monarchy, 2 Samuel 7, to whom God made promises to David, of whom if he had sons that obeyed, they would sit on his throne forever, and sons who disobeyed would be disciplined. Daniel, like all of us reading Old Testament history, is waiting for that Davidic son who will not sin, who will have the right to sit on David's throne over Israel and Judah, the combined nation. And the promises of blessing in the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic Covenant, and the Davidic Covenant, and the New Covenant are all outstanding. In other words, God has made promises that have not yet been fulfilled. Daniel's prayer is a prayer of faith in what God had said. And so Daniel is praying God's words back to God throughout this prayer. Look down at verse 21. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me. Who is this Gabriel? Look over at chapter 8 and verse 16. This was the ram and goat vision Daniel had seen before. He said, I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli, and he called out, and he, and he said, uh, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So I came near to where I was standing, and when I came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he, that is Gabriel, said to me, Son of man, understand this vision. And Gabriel gave him the understanding of the ram and goat vision. Here it says, Gabriel appears to him as a man. We learn something about angelic beings here, that they can come in the form of a man. We find Gabriel a couple of other places in our Bibles. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1. By the way, there are only two angels named in the Bible. We could assume they, the rest of the angels have names. But perhaps only Gabriel and Michael wore name tags and could be identified as such. So the only ones that are uh, given names. Uh, Medieval Catholicism has given a number of other names to angels. And so there's sort of the common Christian mythology of angel names. They end up showing up some of those names as characters of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, But the only two angels named are Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel shows up in Luke chapter 1. Look at this in verse 19. The angel answered Zacharias and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring to you this good news. Uh, What was the good news that Gabriel was bringing to Zechariah? Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. Gabriel had come to tell Zechariah, that John the Baptist would prepare the way for Messiah. And then look down at verse 26 of Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. The angel said in verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. What Gabriel announces to Mary is the answer to Daniel's prayer. And it's interesting that Gabriel comes to Daniel to announce to him that Messiah will come and gives him the exact time frame of Messiah's coming. 
And then in a little town of Bethlehem, you almost started singing it, I know. Gabriel is telling Mary that Messiah is here, or will soon be here, conceived in her womb. Gabriel came, Daniel says, during his extreme weariness, having been made weary in my weariness, Daniel says. And Daniel indicates that this arrival was at the time of the evening offering. That would have been 3 to 4 p.m. And what's interesting here is in Babylonian captivity, Daniel is still praying as if the temple still stood and the sacrificial system were still operating. You can just see Daniel's homesickness for Jerusalem, Daniel's longing for God's glory to be manifested in the special place of his dwelling on the holy mountain in Jerusalem in sight of all of the nations with Israel as its host. Daniel misses the regular operations of God's manifest presence in the temple. And so he is praying even at the same time the evening offering would have been offered. Again, this is 65 years plus since he was abducted as a teen and hauled off to Babylon. Daniel's isn't the only example of this. Ezra 9, 5, we read, At the evening offering I arose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn, and I fell on my knees and stretched out my hands to Yahweh my God. And Ezra similarly praying when the sacrificial system isn't operating the way that it should, he prays at the same time that the evening offering would have been given. Psalm 141, 2, a psalm in exile. May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the psalmist writes. The lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. And there is this hope and this longing that God would restore Israel. And in the meantime, we're going to pray at the time the evening offering would have been given. That's what Daniel is doing here. And pay attention to what Daniel was praying for. Verse 20. Israel's sin and the city, the, the holy mountain, the special dwelling place of God, Mount Zion. What is Daniel praying for here? The spiritual condition of the people and the restoration of the geography. People and a land. What does Daniel want? A turning from sin for the nation. He wants soft hearts. This is a new covenant prayer. We remember the refrain from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, do not forget over and over and over again. And the refrain from the prophets, we looked at this a few weeks ago. You forgot, therefore the exile. What does Daniel want? A nation obedient from the heart, the nation being blessed in the land of promise, and God's special presence dwelling with his people once again, all for God's name's sake. And notice God's answer. Look down at verse 24. Seventy sevens have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Do you see that? God comes to Daniel and answers the thing he is praying for. Daniel prayed for the people and for the city. God comes to him and says, 77s are decreed for the people and for the city. This is God's answer to Daniel's prayer. God sent the angel, Gabriel, to answer Daniel's prayer by revealing the time frame and the circumstances of Israel's restoration. Again, the return to the land was not Daniel's only concern. Covenant faithfulness was in his heart. He wanted to see the blessing in the land, the Davidic king, circumcised hearts, and all that would go with those promises. That's the interruption. Next, let's look at the instruction. This is found in verses 22 and 23. Gabriel gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Gabriel came to give Daniel insight and understanding. It means that from God's vantage point, clarity of understanding what is about to be said and the vision that Daniel has received is important to God. God wants Daniel to understand. God wanted his message to be clear. And again, because this is written down for us, I believe God wants us to understand. Look down at verse 23. 
Give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. These are commands to Daniel from God through Gabriel. And this ought to remind us of the words of our Lord in Matthew chapter 24. I want you to turn there. And you need to understand that there are some commentators, some interpreters who want to see the the vision that Daniel describes here at the end of Daniel chapter 9 as having been fulfilled at the first advent. That is, it's already done. All of that's already finished when Christ came the first time. But listen to Jesus' words here in Matthew 24. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, and listen to this little parenthesis, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. By the way, this is referenced in Revelation 12. Uh, the, the very thing, the very command that Jesus gives here is picked up in Revelation 12. You know that John the Revelator wrote this long after Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended. And long after, in fact, probably 25 years after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. These things were not fulfilled in the first century. These things are still outstanding, still future, and Jesus gives a command very similar to Gabriel's command. Jesus says, let the reader understand. Let the reader of what? Let the reader of Daniel. He quotes Daniel 9 right here in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolations. Let the reader of Daniel understand and then obey these commands. That tells us a couple of things about predictive prophecy. There are places where predictive prophecy contains commands that are to be obeyed. And that tells us something about the perspicuity of predictive prophecy. Perspicuity, what is that? That's not very clear. Perspicuity just means clarity. I don't know why we have to use an obscure word to describe clarity. We just mean it's clear. Clear enough to be understood and people be held accountable for it. So Daniel is accountable here for understanding the vision. Jesus quotes Daniel 9 and says, let the reader understand. So readers are now accountable for understanding the details of Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 9. And those who are present in Revelation chapter 12 must obey these commands. Lest they be trapped and killed and martyred in the city. They're told to flee. So this is really remarkable. These commands demanding that we pay attention to this vision. And notice in verse 23 what Daniel says, Gabriel uh, says, at the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. Uh, Who issues commands to Gabriel? God does. God does. We saw that same thing in Luke chapter 1. God sent Gabriel to announce to Mary that Messiah was coming. And here, God sent Gabriel to answer Daniel's prayer. What do we learn about angels here? They are not omniscient. Angels don't know everything. They are finite beings in their knowledge. They are to be commanded and they obey orders. We also learn that angels are not omnipresent. How do we know that from this text? Because as soon as Daniel started praying, Gabriel was commanded to go to him. And Gabriel didn't get there until verse 19. He interrupted Daniel's prayer well into Daniel's supplications. That just means it took a little time. Uh, People might debate, theologians and physicists, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin and how fast can they dance? Uh, How fast does it take for an angel to get from the throne room of God at the behest of God's command all the way down to Babylon and to answer Daniel's prayer? Well, we don't know. But it took him at least till verse 19 to interrupt Daniel's prayer. We simply learn from this that angels are not omnipresent. They are singularly present. They must be dispatched. They must be sent. They are commissioned to a task. They are servants and they serve God. We find out in the book of Revelation that angels call themselves a sundulos, a fellow slave with believers of the living God. 
God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God heard Daniel's prayer immediately and dispatched the angel. Hebrew 1 tells us that angels are God's ministering spirits sent to help those who will inherit salvation. By the way, God doesn't need angels to accomplish things, but he chooses to use angels as means to serve the saints. You may ask, well, why does God do that? Do you remember the comfort that Elisha's servant received when God had put armies of angels in chariots of fire surrounding the mountains and the hillsides to allay his fears about some puny human army? Uh, There's something to that, that God has armies, hosts of angels that he dispatches for the aid of his beloved. Did you notice that Gabriel said that Daniel was highly esteemed? Some of our English translations say that you are greatly beloved. Uh, The word here is someone or something that is desired or counted as precious or treasured. This is heaven's view of a forgiven sinner. Pretty remarkable. Uh, take, Take the best of believers and think rightly about their sin before a holy God. And the best of believers are enemies of God naturally. Separated from him by their sin. Their hands are covered with blood. Their sins have made a separation between them and God. And and nothing could bridge the gap. No merit, no behavior, no cleaning themselves up. Total depravity applied to Daniel. And yet Daniel is greatly beloved. What a comfort that is for sinners. How great a love the Father has shown that we would be called his children. That we would have the right to be called the children of God by new birth. That the love of God would be poured out in our hearts by his Holy Spirit whom he has given us. To be loved by God. What a a staggering thing. And this title for Daniel here, the one highly esteemed or greatly beloved, is, is tender. It's heaven's view of a forgiven sinner. It reminds us of John the Apostle, the human author of the New Testament twin of the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. Remember what John was called? The disciple whom Jesus loved. There was a personal affection in the friendship of Jesus and his humanity with the Apostle John. John was, of course, loved by God through God's grace in saving a sinner. And yet, Jesus also expressed fond affections for him as a friend. And this was a title that John thought so endearing. He regularly referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Not as a boast. In fact, he wouldn't say, I, John, he's kind of refers to himself in the third person. I don't really want to talk about myself, but can you believe that Jesus loved me? And so he carried this affectionate title. It seems similar for Daniel here. Highly esteemed, greatly beloved, treasured by God. The third part of this answer is illumination. It begins in verse 24. What is God's answer to Daniel's prayer? God's answer to Daniel's prayer is the unfolding future history of the nation of Israel. Pay attention to this very closely. Look at verse 24. Seventy sevens have been decreed for what? For your people and your holy city. Clearly a reference here to Israel and to Jerusalem, the Jews and their geography. That is what all the rest of this chapter is about. Verses 24 to 27, God's answer to Daniel's prayer is about the unfolding future history of the nation of Israel. And we're not going to take the time this evening. I know this is like a total cliffhanger. What does it mean? Tune in next time. That's where we're going. But I want to give you a little bit of a preview. I want to summarize the mass of predictions in these four short verses. First of all, 
a definite 490 year time frame for God to finish his plan for Israel. They say, wait a second, where do you get 490 years? We'll go into this in more detail two weeks from now. But when Daniel says 70 weeks, that most of our English translations have weeks, that word for weeks is simply the plural form of the word seven. We should read this truly, 70 sevens have been decreed for your people. What's a seven? I don't know. We just got to kind of let this passage unfold for us. It will become clear, but you need to know the next, very next chapter in Daniel chapter 10, the same word is used, sevens, but it's combined with the phrase of days. So in Daniel chapter 10, you have sevens of days. What is a seven of days? That's a week. This here is just seven. We've got sevens of something. Uh, They're not sevens of days. They're not weeks. Because that's differentiated in the very next chapter. Um, By the way, if you do the math on sevens of days, you get nonsense here in terms of historical fulfillment of this passage. If you do sevens of months, you also get nonsense. These details don't point to anything specifically. But if you have sevens of years, then you get precise chronology. For the return from Babylonian exile, for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem to the arrival of Messiah in the triumphal entry down to the very day. And then you get a leftover seven with a gap in between. This is remarkable stuff. And we'll take time in the, uh, two weeks from now to show other examples in Scripture of sevens being used of years. That concept is not foreign to the Bible. And we'll also show the math from the book of Revelation where sevens of years equal the time frames given for seven years, 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, and all of those things, and they compute. So uh, just hold on to that. Uh, We will lay out in detail uh, where we get this sevens of years. But for now, just as a placeholder, if you do 70 sevens, 70 times seven is what? 490. And so if the 77s are 77s of years, then we end up with 490 years to accomplish some very specific things for the Jews and for Israel, the land, specifically for Jerusalem, its capital. So here's a list of predictions this text makes. A definite 490 year time frame for God to finish his plan for Israel. Jews return from the Babylonian exile. Jerusalem will be rebuilt after the exile under duress. We get the exact date of Messiah's arrival. We will have Messiah's death predicted. We will have the prediction that his kingdom is not established in his first coming. We get the prediction that Jerusalem is demolished by the Romans. The temple will be destroyed. And then we get a gap in the 490-year prophetic timeline a space of time that is unspecified that splits the 490 490 year plan for Israel into a 483 year segment and a seven year segment separated by an unspecified amount of time. We get the prediction of wars and desolations for Israel's future during that unspecified time. We get the prediction of Antichrist's origin in a revived Roman Empire. The prediction of Antichrist's arrival, the prediction of Antichrist's seven-year treaty with Israel, the prediction of a rebuilt temple in that day in Jerusalem, and the reinstitution of the sacrificial system. We get a prediction of Antichrist's breaking of the treaty halfway through the seven years. We get a prediction of the end of sacrifices in that temple. We get a prediction of Antichrist making Jerusalem desolate by his abominations. Then we get the prediction of the destruction of the Antichrist. We get a prediction of Israel's national repentance, the completion of all prophecy, the beginning of Messiah's kingdom, and the anointing of yet a new temple. All of that is here in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. We'll unpack the details of that two weeks from now, Lord willing. I want to take a few moments and think about the importance of this section for several areas of thought. 
let's just think first of all for bibliology and apologetics. What does this section of Daniel mean for our Bibles and the way we think about our Bibles? That God is the author of history. It is his story. He has written out human history before it began. God tells the future because God already wrote it. God knows and can say exactly what will take place because he is sovereign. That is one of the predominant themes of the book of Daniel is God's sovereignty. And his sovereignty sets himself apart from every other so-called God, all the gods of the nations that Israel was tempted to worship. And God's ability to predict the future further validates and vindicates his identity as the one true God. Everybody else is a fraud. This is really important for our understanding of God and his word. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 41. And the prophet Isaiah, in chapters 40 to 48, those nine chapters in Isaiah's prophecy, lay out the uniqueness of Yahweh. He is incomparable. There is nobody like him. And the corollary to that is the absolute folly of idolatry. The one true God is unique. He is the God over all things. He is the sovereign over all nations. He is not a regional deity confined to some puny little nation in the Middle East. He is the only God. And so to worship sticks and stones and things that can't hear or speak is absolute folly. It is a rebellion that comes with consequences. But to demonstrate this uniqueness of Yahweh, we get uh, one piece of Isaiah's argument in Isaiah 41. And this is, a, this is an open challenge to all other gods. Uh, step up into the ring with Yahweh and demonstrate that you're a god too. Go ahead, Marduk, Molech, Asherah, any of them. Step into the ring with Yahweh and here's what God says. Present your case, Isaiah 41:21. Yahweh says, bring forward your strong of arguments, the the king of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what is coming. Verse 23, declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are gods. Indeed, do good or evil, that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Behold, you are of no account. You are nothings. That's Yahweh's open challenge. You got another contender? Some other God? Tell me the history. Silence. Tell me the future. Nothing. And we go on in Isaiah. Look down at verse 44. Or chapter 44. And verse 24. Thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb, I, Yahweh, am the maker of all things. Again, no regional deity, the creator and sustainer of all things. Stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness. What are those boasters and diviners and wise men and knowledge guys? What what is that all about? Um, Those are pretenders. Those Those are people with parlor tricks trying to convince you that they can tell the future with divination and omens. Sometimes with the help of, of demons who, by the way, um, can't predict the future perfectly, but they could probably do better than us. And so some people fall for these tricks. God challenges all of them and confounds their divination. Verse 26, he confirms the word of his servant and he performs the purpose of his messengers. It is I, Yahweh says, who says of Jerusalem, she will be inhabited. And the cities of Judah, they shall be built and I will raise up her ruins again. It is I who says to the depth of the sea, be dried up and I will make your rivers dry. And it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built and the temple, your foundation will be laid. 
What a fascinating prophecy. 150 years before Daniel's time, an Isaiah named Cyrus, who in the year 539... Uh, destroy, overcomes Babylon and becomes the new emperor. This is the same time Daniel's praying this prayer in Daniel 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Isaiah has prophesied Cyrus by name. Cyrus's parents didn't even know his name when God made this prediction. God is the one who can tell the future. So when we think about the book we're holding in our hands, the Bible, it is written by a God who predicts and who stakes his own identity on the predictions he makes coming to fruition in exact detail. That means we have to pay attention to this book. The, the predictive prophecy proves something about the nature and character and, and errorlessness of the book. But they ought to lead us to fear of the author of the book. A reverential awe of the one who has written it. The sovereign one who is in control of all things. The one who holds you in his very hand and gives you breath. And the one who tells you the exact details of what will come to pass. This ought to make us read the book of Revelation and pay attention to its details. The details of Daniel 9. Exquisite. Trustworthy. The details of Isaiah 44 precise and came about exactly as God said, down to the name of the man who carried out God's orders. And that means looking forward into the future. How do we treat God's book? Same way. And think about the exquisite details with which Messiah came in his first advent. We should not think that somehow the details concerning his second advent get spiritualized, thrown into a theological blender and mixed up so we can't really take them at face value. No, we, we take them the same way the Old Testament predictions about his first coming came. This is important for apologetics. Obviously, th those who would doubt the reality of the scriptures that this is a breathed out book from God all of that fails in the book of Daniel. Think about what this means for prophecy, and particularly a prophetic gap. In Daniel chapter 9, the, the prophetic gap is actually outlined for us. We can see it in the text. But I want to show you this phenomenon in a couple other places. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And what I mean by the prophetic gap, if you were with us early in the book of Daniel, we talked about this. Uh, if you were in the south, far southeast valley, Queen Creek area, and you're looking up toward the Superstition Mountains and Four Peaks, if you look at them from Queen Creek, it, it looks like one mountain range. right? But if you're looking at the Superstition Mountains, Superstition Mountains over here, kind of that big square block out there, you can see it right out the front doors, right? And then Four Peaks looks like four peaks, and they're sitting out there, and from our vantage point, from Grace Bible Church, you can see space between them. And if you drive up Beeline Highway, you recognize, well, there's a lot of space between Four Peaks and Superstition Mountains. But if you're in the Queen, southeast Queen Creek area, Santan Valley, it looks like one mountain. The, the prophetic gap is like that. There are places in the Old Testament where an Old Testament prophet is looking forward to Messiah's work, and it looks like one mountain range. And then you get up there, you, you, you get to Bethlehem, and you're thinking, yeah, we're getting up to this mountain range, it's great, it's that block thing and those four jagged peaks, and it's all one thing. And then you're driving up the Beeline Highway, you're, you're getting up to the life of Christ, and then his death, burial, resurrection, and no kingdom. Acts 1, is this the time where you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? No, it's not for you to know. I'm leaving, preach the gospel to the nations, I'm coming back. And what do you find at the Beeline Highway? Well, he's actually separated by a, by a lot of space. The first advent, second advent realities. There is a gap. And there's a gap where what looked like an Old Testament prophecy to be squozen together. Right? I want you to see some of those uh, places where the, the prophecies are there, but the gap's not detailed. Isaiah 9, 6. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Um, Isaiah 9, 6a 
and Isaiah 9, 6b are separated. At, at least by a couple millennia so far. There is a gap right in the middle of a verse. And I don't know that Isaiah saw it. At least not here. By God's design and outbreathing of the scriptures, Messiah's work of being born as a son, being given as a son, and reigning on the earth, having the, the government of the world rest on him. We don't see a separation of that in Isaiah 9, 6. But clearly there is. Turn to Isaiah 61. Oh my goodness, we are out of time. We're going to race through these. This is... We need to get to the details of the prophecy next time we're together. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me. There's a nice Trinitarian verse. Holy Spirit, uh, God the Father, and me, the servant. That is the second person of the Trinity. Because Yahweh has anointed me, that is Jesus, to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God. Notice that in Isaiah 61 2, the servant is coming and he'll preach good news. He'll bind up the brokenhearted. He'll bring healing and vengeance. Turn to Luke chapter 4. This is such a remarkable scene. Jesus is in a synagogue. This scroll of Isaiah is handed to him for the reading. Jesus opens the scroll, moves to this section, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and in Luke 4, 18, he quotes it. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Verse 20, And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Did you notice what Jesus left out? Isaiah 61, 2b. Isaiah handed back the scroll in the middle of a verse. In other words, the first half of the verse was fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. But the second half of the verse has to wait. What is the second half of the verse? The wrath of God. The vengeance of God. First advent, second advent realities. Both in Isaiah 61, Jesus splits them in his reading of Isaiah in the synagogue. One more, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Zechariah starts with a Z, somewhere near the end of the alphabet, near the end of the Old Testament. There we go, Zechariah. Listen to Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, just and endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off. He will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You have in Zechariah 9, 9, and 10, the king... The Messiah coming in humility to Jerusalem and then instigating world peace. Now, this gets picked up in John chapter 12. And, and what happens? Jesus comes in his first advent, humble, mounted on a donkey, the foal of a donkey, a colt. And he comes to Jerusalem. In fact, we're going to see this uh, promise related to Daniel 9's prediction of Messiah coming but no world peace. Uh, again, you have this uh, prophecy of first advent, second advent realities sandwiched together. We get to the first advent and Jesus leaves and we realize there's space between Jesus coming humbly and establishing world peace. We see that there is space between Jesus preaching the gospel and coming in vengeance. And we see there is space 
between Jesus being born as a son and Jesus ruling the earth. Daniel's interesting because Daniel actually tells us there is a gap. We'll look at that in detail in two weeks. Let me give you one more uh, importance for this section, and it is simply the importance for Jews of today. A Jew who believes, equal footing with Gentiles who believe. Jew and Gentile together in, in, the, in the church. That was a mystery in the Old Testament. It's a reality now. Anybody who's a Jew who believes in, in Christ is part of the church. We are one new man, Paul says. And for the apostate nation of Israel, they must understand from the book of Daniel that there is no other Messiah than Jesus of Nazareth. And listen, that is a blasphemous idea in the world of Orthodox Judaism. But according to Daniel 9, Messiah had to arrive at the end of the 69 sevens. That is, at the end of the 483 years. He had to have come before the destruction of the temple in AD 70. He had to be cut off and left with nothing, no earthly kingdom, not seated on David's throne, no Psalm 2, no Psalm 110. He had to be killed by the Romans. Look, who fits the description of having come after 483 years, but before AD 70? None other but Jesus of Nazareth. And the Jews who had the Old Testament must believe in Jesus as Messiah, Yeshua as Mashiach. There is no other. This is critically important for our Jewish evangelism, our prayer for the peace of Israel. I want to tell you briefly about the testimony of Rabbi Leopold Cohn. He is the founder of the Brownsville Mission to the Jews. It's now known as Chosen People Ministries. Cohn was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi born in Hungary in 1862. After years of religious study under other rabbis, uh, feeling the angst of the problem of Judaism, of not being in the land, a destroyed temple, totally in exile, scattered around the world, and wondering when Messiah would come to rescue Israel. And he was a student who had studied the 12th century rabbi Maimonides, I knew I was going to say that wrong. I'm going to try one more time. Maimonides. Um, Rambam, we'll just call him Rambam. That's Jews call him Rambam. Rambam established 13 essential tenets of Orthodox Judaism in the late 1100s. Number 12 on his list was the belief in the arrival of Messiah and the Messianic era, still future. Well, Rabbi Cohn was... Um, rehearsing these 13 tenets of Orthodox Judaism every morning for his morning devotions, sort of robotically. And after years of this, he became burdened. When will Messiah come? And in his study of Daniel chapter 9, which was prohibited reading, by the way, it led him to believe that Messiah had to arrive some 400 plus years after Daniel received the prophecy. He began to research who could it have been. In 1892, Rabbi Cohn moved to New York. He was introduced to Jews who believed in Messiah, that Messiah had already come and that it was Jesus. And he read from the New Testament for the first time in the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. This is the book of the generation of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He did not immediate belief. This would have been a blasphemous idea for an Orthodox Jew even to entertain. But after much wrestling, he was eventually born again. He believed that indeed Messiah had already come, that the nation had missed their time, and then he was persecuted by fellow Orthodox Jews. He eventually founded what has become known as Chosen People Ministries with the goal of reaching other Jews with the news of Messiah. What a tragedy that the people to whom Messiah came first missed him. And my friends, what a tragedy would it be if you were here hearing this and you missed Christ also. There is no other Savior. No one else who could forgive your sin. No one else who could give you access to God. There's no one else who meets the qualifications. Jesus alone 
who is called the creator of all things and the savior is the only one who fits the description of Daniel 9. He's the only one who fits the requirements for Messiah. And he has come. And my friends, he will come again. When he comes again, it will not be to pay for sin. He will not come humbly. He will come with a sharp sword in his mouth to lay waste to his enemies. He will come and fulfill the vengeance of the day of the Lord. He will come to judge the earth dwellers who refuse to believe. And today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Entrust yourself to Jesus the Messiah, to have forgiveness of sin and to have God and to have everything. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you. We have no right to your mind and yet you have graciously revealed it to us. You have given us your word. We can bank on it. We thank you for its exquisite details. We thank you for what predictive prophecy reveals about you and about this book. We thank you for the way it pokes at us. We dare not tarry. We dare not trifle with you or with coming judgment. Rather, O Lord, let us be those who long for your appearing, who love your appearing, who cannot wait for the vindication of your glory and the rescue of your saints in the earth. And Lord Jesus, we remember that when you came in your triumphal entry, you wept over Jerusalem. May we weep over those who do not yet believe. Simultaneously longing for your return and your glorious vindication and pleading with you to rescue sinners whom we love who do not yet believe. Give us hearts of compassion like yours. Make us bold proclaimers of truths the truths of what you have already accomplished and the truths of who you are and what you will do in the future. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 